the book of Galatians. Um, if you were here on a Sunday, I'm trying to remember what Sunday that was. I think it was three Sundays ago on the 28th or 21st or so, I was able to teach, had the opportunity to teach on Galatians 1. And I'm going to continue this evening in Galatians chapter 2, and hopefully throughout the rest of the month, and as uh, my dad ends up going to Sudan, we will continue on through the book of Galatians, and eventually we will get to the end of this little book here. And it's such a neat book. It's, it's a powerful book. Um, as I encouraged you in chapter 1, I encourage you again to read the book of Galatians, to study it, to allow it to just affect your life. So many great men uh, have been affected by this book and, uh, and have been er- very open to the power of this book in their lives. And uh, the book of Galatians is um, it, it's so vital to a believer. It really is. And, and hopefully you will enjoy it just as much as I have in studying the book of uh, Galatians. And, and in chapter 1, we... Just to go back a little bit, we, uh, we saw Paul kind of introducing himself to, uh, once again, the Galatians as he began his introduction with grace and peace, as he always does, writing, once again, to uh, not a specific church, but to a people, to believers, to multiple churches that were there in, uh, in Galatia, in this region here, nor- in the northern area of the Mediterranean Sea. And if you were not able uh, to... Be here for Galatians chapter 1. You can go online and you can listen to the study online on our website. You can also see Moses if you'd like the CD and he can get you a CD if you'd like. But again, I encourage you to just continue along with us as we pick apart the book of Galatians. And I guarantee you, you will be blessed by it. Let's go ahead and read once again here in uh, chapter 2 of Galatians, verse 1 and 2. It says, Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and also took Titus with me and one up by revelation and communicated to them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to those who were of reputation, uh, least they uh, by any means I might run or had run in vain. And Paul, here in chapter 2 of Galatians, he continues on with his testimony that he started there in chapter 1. And again, in chapter 1, he gets into the greeting uh, to the body there. He gets into uh, a little bit of uh, astonishment that he shares with them as he shares uh, that that scripture there in verse 6, chapter 1, verse 6. He says, our marvel that you are turning away uh, uh, so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. So he shares some concerns with those in Galatia. And then he gets into his testimony. And he gets into his testimony there in verses 11 and and really 18. uh, There speaking of his conversion and kind of what the Lord did in the early years of his life. And, And how important, how powerful uh, that testimony is to a believer, right? That testimony is so powerful to somebody who can sit back and just have the confidence in the Lord. You know, confidence in the Lord is, is so important that uh, this is not just a book that we're reading or, or some stories, you know, that we've been told. This is not just some ideas that we think you know, uh, have the possibility of having some truth or weight behind them. But we can have the confidence that this is the living word of God. That this word of God here is true, it's powerful, it is 100% accurate, and there's nothing in here that we have to worry uh, about being accurate or true. And uh, it's, it's uh, so neat to have that personal testimony. And I would encourage you that if you do not have or you do not know your testimony, to figure out what that testimony is. To ask the Lord to reveal what your testimony is. And your testimony will, uh, will consist of different things. It will consist of the power of God in your life. It will consist of your old man or your old being. And it will consist of personal testimony, personal accounts. And it will also consist of, uh, uh, again, just kind of what the Lord has done already uh, the work that he has done on the cross and also in your life. And this testimony is so powerful. Paul comes to the Galatians with his testimony. And here in chapter two, really what we see is a continuation 
of his testimony. Paul left off there in chapter 1 with the beginning and he jumps right in here in the middle of uh, his testimony here in chapter 2 verse 1. And remember who Paul is writing to. Paul is writing to the Galatians. And, uh, and Paul says uh, here in verse 1, he says, Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and also took Titus with me. So Paul is saying it's been 14 years since he had been to Jerusalem. Uh, much went on with Paul. Remember Paul as he got saved there on the road to Damascus. He went on his first missionary journey, right? And his first missionary journey, he, as he uh, left the area, he went around the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, teaching and preaching the word of God to many different areas there in the region, one of them being Galatia. But it had been 14 years since he had come back to Jerusalem. And again, a lot had gone on during this time. And Paul's testimony here of his first missionary journey can be found in the book of Acts, chapters 9 through 14. If you want to write that down, I would encourage you to go back and to read Acts 9 through 14 and 15 even, and get a background as to what the book of Galatians is speaking of. Uh, We read a lot of, again, Paul's first missionary journey here, and what had happened there was so neat as far as what the Lord had been doing in his life. By this time, uh, John Mark had abandoned Paul on their journey there. By this time, he had preached the gospel in many, many cities. He had been run out violently in many cities. He had experienced many miracles. Uh, He had been called, uh, uh, Paul and others had been called gods because of the miracles that were shown. And he had seen many come to know Jesus. 14 years of walking with the Lord. 14 years of the Lord just doing so many awesome, neat, amazing things within Paul's life. And as he begins here in chapter two, he's retelling an account that happened in Acts chapter 15, right? Acts chapter 15 next to Galatians 2 there in your Bible. And in Acts chapter 15, we read about men, so-called Christian men, believers, it says uh, so-called brothers that were in the Lord, that were telling the converted Gentiles that unless you are circumcised, And unless you are circumcised and you follow the law according to the customs of Moses, that you cannot be saved. And this is an important point that Paul points out here, that these are not Pharisees. These are not Sadducees. These are are not uh, Jewish, you know, uh, religious leaders. These are men that call themselves Christians. These are followers of Christ that are making these claims to the Gentile believer here in the area of Jerusalem. And he continues on in verse 3. Let's read it. He says, Yet not even Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. I don't know about you, but I would hate to be the guy responsible for going around and convincing people to be circumcised. It doesn't sound like a fun job, right? Probably a pretty difficult job that these uh, men had. And Paul points out that not even Titus was convinced or compelled to be circumcised. Why did Paul point out that not even Titus? Think about who is doing the compelling here and who is on the receiving end of the compelling. First, Paul points out that Titus and uh, Titus was an accepted, prominent Gentile believer. He was Greek and he was a believer in Jesus Christ. He was not a Jew. He had never been circumcised. He was not of, you know, he didn't follow the Jewish law as Paul did and many of the Jews there in the area. Uh, And Paul points out that not even this Gentile who was a follower of Jesus was compelled. Titus understood the difference between the bondage of the law and the freedom that we find in grace. And these so-called religious men were beginning to put the pressure on Titus. They're putting the pressure on the Gentiles that they had to, they needed to do these certain things in order to have a right relationship with God. 
Christians trying to convince other Christians, not just to be circumcised, but to be put back under the law. Yes, Jesus came and died on the cross for us, and that's all great, and salvation is awesome, and, and having that grace, but, but you must follow these certain laws. But don't forget the commandments of Moses. But make sure that you do these certain things. And I'm sure we've all, if we've been with the Lord long enough, you've come across people like this, uh, you know, like these uh, these so-called believers here. I can remember one time, excuse me, one time at work, uh, this older gentleman, you know, um, said he was a believer and, and, you know, I, and I, I don't know, it was a client of mine. I can't remember as a while ago, how we got on the topic or the subject, but he, you know, knowing just through dialogue and conversation that I was a believer, he asked me how I was baptized. Yes. But how were you baptized? Um, I don't know with water, you know, submersion. He said, no, but were you baptized? You know, when they baptized you, did the, did you, you know, say the, the, the special words, you know, the, the special saying, you know, it wasn't abracadabra, but whatever it was, you know, did you, you know, and was it in this manner? And if it wasn't, then it didn't count and you need to go and get baptized or you're not going to go to heaven. And I was like, wow, man, you know, and, and just story after story of people that again would claim to be believers in Jesus yet have some type of attachment to that claim some type of attachment to the freedom or the grace that we find in the Lord. And Paul says that not even Titus, a Gentile, was convinced. Why? Because Titus knew Jesus, right? Titus knew the truth. You know, try convincing me that my dad who I've lived with every day of my life is not my dad. You can have a pretty hard time convincing me of that, right? But if, you know, I didn't have a relationship with my dad, if he was somebody that I never knew growing up, well, then that might make your job a little bit easier, right? You might be able to convince me. And the same was true for Titus here. He knew who his father was. He had a deep relationship with his God and somebody coming in with such claims, you know, would have no effect on Titus. And the same is true for the believer today, right? Rarely do I hear of a strong, grounded believer in the Lord being compelled to leave God and, and to follow after certain things. Who do we normally hear of that, are, that is easily persuaded? It's the one that doesn't know the Father. It's the one that doesn't have a strong, deep, grounded relationship with the Lord who is willing to just go off and believe, you know, whichever thing is brought up that day. Verse four here in Galatians two, it says, and this occurred because of false brethren secretly brought in who came in by stealth to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage to whom we did not yield submission even for an hour that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Misery enjoys company, right? Misery enjoys company. Those under the law will try to compel you to do the hard things that they feel that is required of them. The things that is just in, that they are in bondage to, the things that are, that, that are just so heavy upon them, they will use conviction and condemnation and every trick in the book to try to place the same bondage, the same burdens upon us. And when it's not accepted, aggravation and frustration begins to set in, right? The conversation begins to get that much more heated. Paul points out that even uh, the liberties that they had in Christ were used against them. They spied out the liberties that we had in the Lord, that they might be brought back into the bondage. And that's one thing that somebody that is in bondage just hates to see in others is that freedom, those liberties, the jealousness almost behind it. You know, and you might say, well, Roman, yeah, I, I, I totally get it. You know, we're saved by Jesus and the cross and, you know, it's not a big deal anymore. You know, and, you know, let me ask you this. Do you feel condemned when you don't go to church on Sunday? Is there some type of condemnation there? Or when you fall into that sin that maybe you've been struggling with or dealing with for a while, do you feel un unworthy to come before the Lord? 
You know, if you believe that you're saved by Jesus and the cross, then believe that nothing that we can do will ever be more powerful than what he has already done on the cross. There is no condemnation in the Lord. And to feel condemned as a believer because of works is to say that the power of the cross is void. It's to say that there is some type of attachment, that there's some type of bondage that we are under, even though we get to uh, enjoy the grace that comes through the Lord. Verse six through nine says this, but from those who seem to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. God shows personal favoritism to no man. For those who seem to be something added nothing to me. Verse seven, but on the contrary, when they saw that the gospel for the uncircumcised had been committed to me as the gospel for the circumcised was to Peter, for he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised also worked effectively in me toward the Gentiles. And when James Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me. They gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that they should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. And I could see Peter and John, you know, here. Oh, you want to go to the Gentiles? Oh, yeah, 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 definitely. Go, go right ahead, Paul. You know, yeah, you want to go, uh, you know, to the area up there and to, the, to Greek and to, you know, to, to all the, the non Yeah, go right ahead. You know, they didn't want the job. They wanted to stay where they were. They wanted to stay where they were comfortable. Again, remember who Paul is writing to. He's writing to the Galatians about his encounter in Jerusalem 14 years into his ministry. And I love how Paul says that there in verse uh, 6. He says, for those who seem to be something he says, Wh- whatever they were, you know, he just kind of brushes them off. Who, yeah, those who thought they were something special, who, whoever they were, you know, those who were respected by men, those who were put on a pedestal, you know, whoever they were, whoever they thought that they might be. They were used to, you know, pressuring people into submission. They didn't have an effect on Paul. They didn't get into Paul's way as he kept moving forward in preaching the gospel in teaching Jesus Christ, in teaching the grace of God. And Paul says that the same God that appointed Peter and the apostles to the Jews appointed Paul to the Gentiles. And that's something that we can just praise the Lord for, right? As Gentiles, we should be very happy of that scripture right there, that God sent the greatest apologist of all time, Paul the apostle, to the Gentile to us, to share all about God's love and all about God's grace. Praise God that Paul wasn't persuaded by these men to follow after the law, to be turned back from the grace where he found salvation and to go back to the bondage of the law and the bondage of tradition. Verse 10 says, they, speaking of the apostles, desired only that they should remember the poor, the very thing which I also was eager to do. And I don't think Paul, you know, I don't think they wanted Paul to remember, you know, to give a few bucks when they saw a homeless person on the corner. You know, hey, Paul, remember the poor. Yeah, go to the Gentiles. Go share the gospel with them, Paul. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, go on about your way. I'm sure they had no idea what the Lord had in store for Paul at this time. Yet God had something really neat in store for Paul, right? He was the perfect person to go to the Gentile. He was the perfect person to share about grace as he was the perfect man because he had lived under the law for so long. He had followed the law of Moses his whole life. And yet the grace of God was so powerful within him. And as they sent him out, they gave him one encouragement and that was, Paul, remember the poor. You know, I think they wanted Paul to remember The gospel is not just for the rich. It's not just for the powerful. It's not just for the prominent. The gospel message is for the needy and the broken. And too many times believers have so many standards that we set up for fellowship within our lives, right? We have so many cliques that go on within the church, you know? 
in teaching the youth, I remember, uh, you know, one of the youth just always encouraging them, you know, to invite their friends. Hey, did you invite your buddies, you know, to a Friday night? Did you ask them to come out? And so many times I hear the answer, you know, oh, they're not church people. They would never come, you know, they would, they would never come out, you know, for an event like this. And I always look back at them and I say, guess what? You're not church people. We're not church people. The grace of God is what has made us church people. They, give, they tell Paul, Paul, remember the poor, remember the needy. That is who the gospel is for. Those that we would look at and say, oh, those aren't church people. That's exactly who the Lord wants to reach. You know, we need to break down these walls within the church, the class warfare, the race wars, the battle of the sexes, all these things that are just set up to divide the church are all from Satan and from the enemy. And this is exactly what we're seeing going on here within Galatia, within the, the body there, the, the believers that are within the book here of Galatians. They're divided. They're divided to who they are following even. Chapter 3 of Galatians, verse 28 says, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all uh, one in Christ Jesus. And if the Lord can find me worthy to associate with, he can find me worthy enough, then who am I to find someone else not worthy enough for me to associate with? God can, can, can come down from heaven from perfection and desire to have that relationship with me. Who am I to turn a cold shoulder to the poor or to the needy or to somebody that I would think that isn't worthy enough to associate with? The one that everyone avoids, you know, that, that person at church. Oh, there's so-and-so again. Oh, let's look the other way or go out the other door. You know, honestly, I believe that there'd be a lot less violence in this country. There'd be a lot less issues. There'd be a lot less school shootings if we could grasp this truth that there is no division among people. There is no Jew. There is no Greek. There is no slave nor free. There is neither male nor female for you are all one in Christ Jesus. That's what the church needs. The church needs believers to stand up and to reach out to the poor, to the needy, to other believers when we see somebody sitting all by themselves even, not talking to anybody, or do we go up to them and say, hey, how's, how's your day? What's going on? Can I pray for you for anything? How are you? Or do we just walk by and we go and join the crowd? Verse 11, hypocrisy and the law. Read with me. It says, now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be, because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he who ate, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is a nasty thing, right? And I don't think hypocrisy is simply a Christian that is struggling with sin. A lot of times we see someone struggling with, oh, that hypocrite. No, hypocrisy is a Christian that is deliberately putting on an act. That they're acting one way in the church or around other believers, and they're acting a whole nother way when they get into the world. When they go to their jobs, when they go to their schools or with, with their friends, they're acting completely different. Peter had some hypocrisy that he needed to deal with. It needed to be dealt with. And uh, usually when we set certain rules, when, when we see people set certain standards within Christianity, most of the time we're the first ones to break those rules, right? You set the rule and what's the saying? Rules are meant to be broken. Usually it's the one that sets the rule that is the one that breaks the rule. What was the encouragement that Peter gave to Paul? P Paul, remember the poor. I leave you with this, Paul. Remember the poor. And when the rich showed up, Peter was the first one to forget the poor. He was the first one to turn his back on the Gentiles and say, oh, let me go over there with the prominent. Let me go over there with the Jewish leaders, with the rich. It's so hard to live up to even our own standards, right? We have such high standards 
that we set. And this is what Paul is doing with the Galatians. He's trying to break down the standards that are being set and being pressed upon the believer's life. Get rid of the standards, get rid of the law and, and, and fully submerge yourself, fully it be engulfed with the grace of God. You know, Barnabas, uh, his name means son of encouragement or comforter. And Barnabas' real name was not Barnabas. This was a name that was given to him in the book of Acts because of his character, because he was a comforter, because he was an encourager. And Paul says there that even Barnabas fell uh, into their hypocrisy. You know, even Barnabas gave up the gifts that God had given him, that gift of encouragement to the poor, to the needy. And Barnabas was persuaded by Peter and by the Jews to give up that gift from God and to go back to the desire of legalism. Corinthians 10, 12 says, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed, lest he fall. I would never, I would never do that. How could they? I, but wouldn't you? If you had the chance, would you not? Did you see so-and-so? Did you, I can't believe them. No, I didn't see them, but I wish you could see you right now. Were they gossiping? You know? We set such high standards. Hypocrisy is a disgusting betrayal to our God. It's a betrayal to the grace and the freedom that we find in the Lord. And this is what is found in Galatia, is hypocrisy. Verse 14 through 16, it says, But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, If you, being a Jew live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? Verse 15, we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by the faith in Christ and not by the works of the law for by the works of the law no flesh shall be justified Paul is saying you guys are enjoying the freedom of your salvation and yet you're trying to put a burden on others you're enjoying the freedom of this grace you know how sad when we come to Christ freely and then immediately we want to you know tack on every rule possible the church is full of rules the church is, is full of these things, you know, and, and it's so sad that, that we come to God freely, that freely the Lord, you know, lives in us, that freely we've been saved by faith through Jesus Christ. And yet we want to pressure and place uh, uh, that burden upon others to live as they were doing there with the Jews and the Gentiles. If you being a Jew live in the manner of Gentiles, and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? To live as a Jew was difficult. It was hard to keep all the laws and the rules and the regulations, just everything that was placed upon them. You know, there were 613 mitzvahs or commandments found in the Old Testament. 613. Every day you had to, 600, okay, did I, this, okay, did I do that one? And that's just the ones found in the Old Testament. That's not even including all the ones that they, you know, tacked on themselves, that they added themselves. Remember Paul's encouragement, as I read earlier in chapter 1, verse 6. I marvel, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. He's giving the Galatians an example here in chapter 2 of even the strongest believers, the believers that walked and talked with Christ, the apostles that had a relationship, a physical relationship with the Lord, turning away and struggling with the grace that is found in him. 
He says, Galatians, learn from our mistakes. Don't allow the focus to be on the law and the works and the do's and the don'ts, but allow it to be on the grace of Christ. Allow the focus to be on the grace of Jesus, on the freedom that we find in the Lord. Verse 16 says, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith in Jesus Christ. Christ. We do not receive any justification by anything that we can do, right? If you're here today because you had a really fun weekend, and by fun I mean bad, then you're wasting your time, right? If you're here because you did something, you know, you partied your butt off, and I got to go to church now on Wednesday. First of all, how dare you be, you know, partying on a Monday or Tuesday, But second of all, you're wasting your time. You're wasting your time. You know, there's no offset, right? There's no, your good can never outweigh your bad. Try it in a court of law. You know, judge, I know I stole that car, but I promise to, you know, give a few bucks or whatever to the poor. You know, I I promise to to do good tomorrow. Is he going to let you off the hook for stealing that car? No. There's a payment that has to be made. Nothing that we can do will wash our slate clean. You know, it's like taking a shower with no water, right? You get out just as dirty as when you went in. And a lot of people come to the Lord like that. There's no living water. There's no way to truly become clean. And and why? Because Jesus really has already done it all. The good work that needed to be done for salvation for us to be righteous was already done 2,000 years ago when Christ died on the cross. And all we have to do now is believe. That's it. How neat that is. But how difficult that concept is for the world to grasp. You know that that is unique to Christianity? Sometimes we take that for granted. Sometimes we say we know we got it, okay? That's unique to Christianity. Every religion in the world does not have that truth within the religion. All we have to do is believe. Christ and the law, Galatians 2, verse 17. says, but if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners. Is Christ, therefore, a minister of sin? Certainly not. For if I build again those things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. If we're seeking after God and we still have sin in our lives that God is working out, it's okay. It's okay. That's what Peter's saying. Let's not freak out and think that in any way it impacts the grace of God. How many times does a believer or somebody come to God and right away we want to clean them all up, right? We want to get them all fixed up and everything. Oh, you, make sure you're not doing this anymore. Make sure you're not doing that, you know, and we want to right away get to the do's and the don'ts. Paul saying, Galatians, I'm not going to hold anything that you do against God. You know, how often we seek to blame God for everything and give God credit for nothing, right? All the mistakes that we see in a believer's life, right away, we want to blame God. We want to blame God for every mistake with, that's made within the church. You know, but if we've been justified or saved by Christ and we're still found to have sinful actions, does that mean that Christ is condoning sin? Does that mean that he's okay with that sin? Paul says, certainly not. Of course not. You know, are we somehow making God a minister of sin? To the Jew, because they're not circumcised? Because they're not following the law because, you know, they didn't do that in the morning like, you know, like you so, holy, so righteous holy people do. Does that mean that Christ is somehow any less powerful or, or a minister of anything other than grace and righteousness? Of course not, Paul says. To the seventh day at Venice because we don't go to church on a Saturday, on the, the true Sabbath, a bunch of heathens going to church on a Sunday, how could you? Right away, the judgment. Tattoos, long hair. 
So many things that we want to just, you know, condemn others for right off the bat. Paul says, look, if sin is found in me, it doesn't change my justification by Christ or who Christ is or the grace of God. Because he gives us grace that doesn't mean also that he gives us the freedom to sin is what Paul is saying. Just because sin is found doesn't mean that God is giving them grace or the freedom to sin. He's not a minister of sin. You know, one time I was coming back from Mexico on a missions trip and, you know, I just felt like the opportunity wasn't there that weekend for me to just share, you know, the Lord with somebody. Like, yeah, there was a lot of things that were going on and I know the Lord was ministering and doing a work, but I just didn't have that opportunity to, you know, just share with somebody personally. And as we were driving back, you know, I, I was just praying that the Lord would give me that opportunity to share with someone, you know, or just to minister to someone. You know, a lot of times at the border, we have our windows down and we're handing things out and, you know, just doing that. And I was just kind of like, man, Lord, I didn't get to pray with anyone. Or I didn't get to, you know, I was kind of bummed out. And as we pull up to the border, to the, you know, the crossing, you know, as usual, we, we pull up and there's the border agent there and, you know, you roll down your window and you hand them all, all of the passports that you have in the car or the IDs. And they ask a few questions. You know, it's funny because everyone's like on their best behavior, you know, sitting up straight and looking forward. And, you know, usually you, you mess around with the new person, you know, like, oh, I can't find your license. Did you give me your ID, your passport? We can't find it anywhere. You know, play it, you know, mess around with somebody. And so we hand them all over to the, the border agent and, uh, and he, he asked the questions, you know, again, like they usually do. And he says, well, what's your business? What, do you, what were you guys doing in Mexico? And we always, you know, I was taught in our trips to always put your Bible on the dashboard, you know, and it may be a little bit of superstition. You might call it that, but we always put our, our Bible on our dashboard when we're, when we're driving, when we get up to the border, right? And really it's just, you know, just through prayer. And we just ask the Lord to, you know, just to lead and guide us and to get us back over the border safely and all that. And, you know, they can see the Bible and everything. And we, you know, they ask, well, what was your, what was your business in Mexico? And so I said, oh, we were just doing a bunch of missions work. You know, we went down to an orphanage and Bible college down there and we just shared with, you know, a bunch of people. And, oh, okay. So you guys are, are from a church, right? You guys are coming here from church. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're from a church, Calvary Chapel and stuff. And, you know, the border agents are all U.S., so, uh, so he was from San Diego and he goes, yeah, I, I, uh, he goes, I used to go to church. I used to go to church in San Diego and everything. And, and I just looked at him and said, used to, so why used to? And he goes, oh, a bunch, you know, there's just too many hypocrites, man, in the church. I said, wow. And I said, but, but what, what does hypocrites in church have anything to do with who God truly is? And I just started to share with him. You know, what is anybody messing up or what they're doing in their life has anything to do with who God truly is? God is God and no matter what I do, I can't tarnish that. Nothing that I can do is powerful enough to tarnish who God truly is or, or his power. And it was so neat that, I, that the Lord just gave me that opportunity to start to minister to this border patrol agent. You know, finally he handed me all back and I told him, hey man, go back to that church. Go back to church there. And you go, okay, you know, give me the, okay, get out of here. You know, go. You know. But too many times the world wants to blame the sin and the hypocrisy found within the church on the Lord. Verse 19 there in chapter two says this, for I, for I through the law died to the law that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. And the ESV version says, I do not nullify or make void the grace of God. So through the law, I died to the law, right? I couldn't keep the law. The law destroyed me. So now I am dead to the law. You know, what do you do with something when it dies? Usually you bury it, right? You dig a hole and you bury it. And if I'm dead to the law, then there's no more relationship 
that I have with the law. There's nothing there for me with the law anymore. My focus is no longer on works. My focus is no longer on good and bad. In essence, we're nullifying the grace of God. We're making void the grace of God because the focus is all on what I can do to receive righteousness from God. I'm making void the good work that Christ already did. If I'm made righteous by my works, then Christ died in vain, Paul says. He should have skipped the cross. Father, if there's any way this cup could be passed from me, Lord, if there's any way that, 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 that this forgiveness or righteousness or salvation can come other than me going to the cross, Lord, let it be, Father. Well, we can try the whole law thing again, you know. I can flood the earth again. No, you got the rainbow, darn it. There was no other way. There's nothing else that could be done. No other great work that would be able to wipe that slate clean and to bring us salvation. Now I live in Christ and it's Christ that lives and works through me. Romans 7, 9, Paul said, I was once alive without the law, but when the law command, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Ignorance is bliss, right? Ignorance is bliss. It's nice to be ignorant sometimes. I was alive, but once the law came, it was death to me because I broke the law of God. You know, ignorance is bliss, but it no longer applies to us, right? Because we showed up for church today. There is no more ignorance that we can have. Have you ever sinned? Then you've died through the law. You've broken the law and it's death to you. Paul says in verse 19, I through the law died to the law. But he says that I might live to God. Everyone will die because of the law, right? Everyone has sinned. And because of that sin, death has been brought through the law. But, but we have also died to the law. But we have died to the law for a reason, for a purpose. And that purpose is that we might live to God. Everyone will die because of the law, but not everyone will live with God. Matthew seven thirteen through 14 says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the great and difficult is the, wi- is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Every, even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear fruit good fruit. And you might say, well, that sounds like a focus on works, focus on the law to me, but really fruit grows naturally, right? Fruit is something that naturally takes place. It's not something that's forced. And the same is true for a believer's life that when we come to the Lord, when we're dead to the law and we're alive in Christ, we will naturally begin to do the law of Christ. We'll naturally begin to do the things of the Lord, whatever the Lord's will is. We will naturally have those things within our lives. It will no longer be a work. Paul says in verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Has your old man been put to death or are you a walking dead? You know, you may have died to the law. You may have died to to works, but you may be walking around a zombie, still not alive in Christ, still not alive to the Lord, spiritually dead, but yet not crucified with Christ. Paul said he crucified that old man. I was crucified with Christ, that Christ may live in me. There's not enough room for the both of us, right? There isn't enough room for you and Christ to live. There's only enough room for one of you. Paul says, Galatians, put to rest once and for all the old man. Let Christ live in you. Let Christ lead you. Let Christ do the work in you, Galatians. Get the focus off of the laws and the circumcision and the persuasion of men to be put back under bondage 
and enjoy the freedom that is found in Christ.